the official podcast of the Sunshine Coast Fire Football Club. We're joined by first team manager Daniel DK Carew and our new number one, Jared Tyson. Lads, thanks for joining us. No Good problem. Yeah, no problem. Debut for you, Jared. Yeah, first time on the podcast and uh, yeah, hopefully a clean sheet. <laughs> Good stuff. Um, first, obviously, question. It's been some time now since you've been able to call Sunshine Coast home. How does it feel to be back? Yeah, fantastic. Um, it's pretty special to be able to have the family close by, uh, you know, to, to play for a club that, you know, I grew up, um, you know, playing with as well is quite special. So, um, you know, although it's been 14 years, the, the coast still does genuinely feel like home and, um, you know, I'm really excited to have come back now here uh, with my wife and um, this is her first experience living on the Sunshine Coast and, and she's loving it just the, the same and um, we're just looking forward to the, the future now of, you um, you know, playing and, and living here and uh, and being a local again. Yeah, fantastic. Just to obviously touch on your career, um, as you said, you played for this club um, a long time ago now, almost what, 19? Yeah, well, 19, 14 years 14 ago, years so ago. it was in 2008, the club's uh, initial um, or inaugural season, Yeah. Um, and that was a great time to be involved with, with the club, and um, obviously was a uh, really instrumental in my professional career kicking off you know we had a fantastic year that year we won the double premiership and, and grand final double and um and then the next year I, I moved on to gold coast united so it was a really um a really pivotal year for me and um you know i've been really grateful to the opportunities that the fire have uh, presented me since the fire you've had an a-league career which has spanned five different clubs obviously one you won the asian champions league with western sydney wanderers and then obviously won only a couple of weeks ago winning the FFA Cup with that Melbourne victory side. Um, you've obviously had a couple of stints in Asia as well. What has been the reason you've come back to the fire and joined the club? Yeah, well, like I'm 32 years old and, uh, you know, I suppose the first thing is this is absolutely not a, a retirement plan for me. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I still feel at this age um, I've got plenty to give and, and feel really good and, and, and like you said, have, have managed to be quite successful at an A-League level um, only recently. So, you know, I feel like it's a great time to come back and really give everything that I've got on and off the field um, to Sunshine Coast Football. and. Um, and beyond that, uh, you know, my, my wife and I thought now was the right time to come back in terms of uh, family reasons as well. Yeah. Um, we're expecting our little girl in, in April, which is really yeah. exciting. Oh, yeah. It'll be my, my first child and, um, and that's really exciting. And we just thought, you know, having been away from home for so long, yeah. um, that, you know, having that family support of the brothers and the sister and the parents and yeah. grandparents, aunts and uncles all around us for this time was going to be really exciting. And, um, Obviously, with that move, I wanted to find somewhere, you know, um, you know, challenging and um, all of that to, to play my football. And, um, you know, I'd obviously been in uh, conversations with, with DK for a long time before that. And, um, and it just worked out that, that now was the right time to put those pieces of the puzzle together. Touching on those conversations, obviously, you spoke to me about them in pre-season and stuff like that. And obviously, they were progressing nicely and it got to a point where the deal was getting finalised, which is obviously, you know, fantastic for our club. Um, not just the senior setup, but the whole club in general, obviously to, to raise its profile, having someone like Jared. In terms of signings that you've made as a manager, I'm sure it probably ranks right up there. It's the best I think I've, I've done. That's not just because he's here. <laughs> <laughs> it's not what you said off camera. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I think it's like, uh, for me, like obviously, there's signings that you make and you spend a lot of time, you know, going over and over. And it was a long process, you know, it was a, uh, a drawn out process in, in the sense of making a lot of things come together to, to fit a right moment. And I think, you know, it, it was all willing, you know, based on, on Jared when he was ready. Um, you know, it's just, I think, just 
being available and being uh, able to sort of just wait and just when the move was then able to come to fruition yeah it'd be silly not to make it all happen so yeah for me though yeah definitely <laughs> like i've made some good good signings in my time but i think i haven't touched on anyone that's uh, uh, of his caliber you know to come into a football club whether it's uh, been at Biwa or you know now at the fire so yeah definitely uh, definitely set my standard now so i've got a lot to uh, to keep raising my bar so we'll see how we go ability is um ability aside obviously his profile what is he going to bring to the club obviously a side of ability how big of a boost is that going to be for for our football club yeah massive i think experience you know i think we had discussions early on about defenders that i've got that are young that need help you know just progressing their football but also having someone behind them that's going to give them good information um you know and give them confidence you know and i think that was, you know, the abilities of one leadership, two, you know, obviously you got the actual physical and and uh, ability on the pitch, but just being a leader and mentor in, you know, the change room and for the younger players that are coming through, plus also all our young goalkeepers, you know, just something that they can aspire to and, and have an actual point of reference. Um, so, yeah, it's not just not just about the ability. There's a lot of factors, uh, which, which, you know, are fantastic. In terms of obviously your experience overseas, how did you find that? I'm sure obviously not a lot of kids um, understand the harsh realities of even moving interstate overseas to obviously better your career. Talk to us a little bit about how you found all those experiences, dealing away with being away from family and yeah, and definitely. Like that. Um, yeah, I suppose it's part of football. Is it's the world game and. It's one of the things that uh, I really love about the game as well is that you can literally go anywhere, you know, visas permitted, um, uh, and, and play your football. So, you know, my dream was always to go and play in Europe, but uh, my visa situation never allowed that. Um, but Asia was always a really good opportunity for me, and uh, I was quite fortunate to, to have a few opportunities to go away. And and uh, and I played in Hong Kong and, and India, had a, a bit of a nasty experience in, in India and that's the other side of football that obviously um, gets talked about every now and then but you know if you have a, a long career unfortunately um, more often than not you're going to come across situations like that so you know that aside my, my time in Hong Kong was absolutely incredible um, also feel really you know fortunate to have played in some really nice countries um, with you know with the national team first of all um, with the under 20s and uh, the under 23s and uh, also you know, playing in the, the Champions League, um, going and playing some of the, the best clubs in China and Japan and Korea and, and these sort of countries was a, a great experience and, um, and something that helped me grow as a person um, and made, I suppose, my more uh, domestic travel a, a bit easier as well, having to play or you know, signing with Perth Glory, uh, Melbourne Victory, um, Western Sydney Wanderers, Gold Coast United, I've been pretty much everywhere. Um, and really enjoyed those experiences. So it's certainly been something that, like I said, it's helped me grow as a person and probably puts me in a really good headspace now to, um, you know, to come back home and, uh, and feel really comfortable about being here. We just touched on it off camera just before. A lot of those A-League clubs you mentioned, you played under one manager in Tony Popovich. You signed him multiple times. Why do you think that is? And yeah, obviously I'm um, assuming... Yeah, well, I had uh, two spells with him um, at Western Sydney and obviously you know had a another opportunity to work with him at, at Melbourne Victory which was great and he's always a, a coach that that pushes you to the absolute limits and uh, I suppose my experience was I went to Gold Coast United as my uh, my first A-League club and I signed there originally as a, a National Youth League player and uh, we had a really successful National Youth League team winning back-to-back -back championships in my first two years so I thought I was a pretty good goalkeeper and then in my third year um, you know, broke in as the number one in the first team there following an injury, um, albeit, but managed to, to hold my spot there for the rest of the year and um, just saw my, my career going up and up and up and, and thought that I was a professional footballer. Uh, but then obviously the, the club folded and um, got replaced by Western Sydney and fortunately enough I was able to, you know, sort of come across and after a pretty, you know, lengthy trial period um, earned my contract there under Popper. But, um, I learned very quickly that I was not a professional footballer and that although I played in a good competition, there was so much of my game on and off the field that needed, um, that needed improving. And, um, and yeah, but I, I suppose 
you know, I had the mentality for it. I had the, the desire to do it and, um, and all the attributes that really connected with the sort of coach that he is. Um, and everyone who who's, knows football in this country will know the sort of demands that that sort of manager um, expects. And um, yeah, I suppose just over that time, you know, he knows what he gets out of me and, and I know what to expect from him. And, um, and that makes for a very comfortable, um, you know, working environment where he always pushes me and I always want to get to, to where he's pushing me. So uh, I'm sure that um, was part of the reason why he brought me in for, for, the, sure. for that short period, um, period of time. Uh, for the FFA Cup recently, for sure. We've had a lot of questions coming through social media. Obviously, it was put out there as a bit of a QA. and a The pretty much number one that's come back is any advice you would give to a young footballer, more specifically, a young goalkeeper, trying to make it in a professional game? Yeah, I mean, it, it is tough. Um, and I suppose I can only give my own personal experience. And um, growing up, my personal experience was always, a, you know, you'd sit in... A room of 300 kids and they'd all you know the, the person talking to you would be like who wants to be a professional footballer all 300 hands would go up and then they'd give you the reality and they'd say they'd, they'd say to you look on on average maybe one of you will make it maybe and you know and naturally everyone turns to that one or two players that are you know surpassing everyone in those early stages of of their careers and um, and you think, oh, it's going to be those two, so I've got no chance. But, um, you know, in the reality, as, as time goes on, um, you know, it's the ones that keep having to work hard and hard that sort of understand that you're going to hit um, hurdles at, at times. And, and for me growing up, I was never the best goalkeeper, not by far. Um, you know, when I played in the Queensland teams, I was always a number one, number two. Um, you know, the same with the national teams, it was always a, a, a number two situation. Um, but I always had to keep grinding and, and naturally as time goes on, injuries come into play, loss of form. Sometimes you just do the right thing at the right time. But yeah. if you ever give up um, or lower your standards at any point um, throughout your, your development, you're gone. Um, and I think that's the biggest thing. You can always, you can always teach ability, uh, but you can't, you can't teach hard work. You can't teach commitment. You can't teach loyalty um, and all those attributes. And I think when it comes down to it, there will be a day where you know two players are going for the same position. Both can run, both can jump, both can use their left foot and right foot. Um, but it'll be the player that's going to rock up and do their best every single day. That doesn't have the attitude problems. That doesn't have the this and the that. Those little one percenters. Yeah. Um, that's going to get picked every day um, when it comes down to. It. And I'd like to think that I'm a, an example of that. That you know when it came down to me and, and another player of, of equal ability, it was my my attitude and my um, commitment and personality that that got me over the line in those times. So that would be my advice to, to young players is don't just have the, the skills, but have all the, uh, the attitude and the commitment and the, the personality to, to go with it. One that's probably given you a bit of a headache, who was the, the striker you feared playing against the most? Ooh. Or maybe player? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know if I really ever feared um, an opponent like naturally you'd look at team sheets from time to time and you go oh they're in form or they're a good player um, you know if you look in the early days you know as a, as a young kid it was Archie Thompson who was always you know at the top of the goal scoring charts um, Bursart Barisha then came into, into fruition you know Jamie McLaren was, was in there you know you go to, to Champions League games I remember playing um, you know Shanghai in a, in a Champions League game in, in China you look at the team sheet and there's Oscar on there from Chelsea there's Hulk on there uh, from the Brazilian national team you've got Elkerson another uh, you know he's now a, a Chinese national but yeah was always golden boots um, you know these type of players um, so I wouldn't say there's ever been like one player that I've ever feared but certainly you do enough um, research on on opposing teams these days with the video analysis mm -hmm. and all these sort of different bits of data um, to you know, be well informed of, of who's going to cause you problems. Yeah. Any questions from you, DT? No, I just, I just think um, you touched on before. Um, we talk about you know players are looking to go to those levels and mentality. Is so it, it, you, you speak to nearly any professional that's been and gone. It's mentality has always been the, the one thing that they've all they all say. You know, it's not necessarily the ability. And you speak to so many players that say that you know I wasn't the best. But mentality got me there. Yeah. That, that little 1%, that little percentages are what matter the most. It's yeah. huge. It's funny that it's just, that's not just in sport, that's just in, 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 in 
everything. Yeah. So it's it's interesting that you know the question that always gets answered is how do I be a pro? Yeah. It's it's always the same answer. You know, yeah. it's always that. You know, even if your experience is that you're one of the top ones in your game, it's still mentality. You still got to get you across the line. Yeah. Um, there's yeah, very think, few but Balotelli's. Very few. Yeah. Um, the rest of them are all mentality. Yeah. So it's crazy. Yeah, and I think there was a time in my career where I knew that as well. Um, and I don't think it was something that was taught for me from a coach. Like I had some some great junior coaches, Gary Newcomb, that's actually in the, the setup here at the Fire with the youth program, was instrumental in my career, um, going from a, a kid, basically, to an adult playing mm. senior football at, at Maruchidor. Um, Paul Bonhoff at Maruchidor as well had a, had a big... Um, he was probably the one that really... Um, instilled that professionalism in me where you shake your coach's hand before and after yeah. training you give them the respect that they deserve um, and outside of that it was just a, a, a raw desire I think inside me that I wanted to be a professional footballer and um, probably a good story to, to tell now given the amount of rain that we've had recently but I can I can genuinely remember as a, as a kid living here on the coast um, you know playing junior football at, at Maruchidor and every time it rained, my mentality was to go out, put my shoes on, go for a run. Because in my head, I was thinking, this is my chance to get ahead of the competition because I can guarantee you that every other player who wants to be a professional on the Sunshine Coast is inside right now, watching TV, staying warm, keeping dry. Um, yeah. And I knew that I needed to do those little extra steps to stay ahead. So I had this circuit around my house that used to take me about three minutes, 10 to, to run. And, um, I kept saying to myself, if I can do this in under three minutes, I will become a professional footballer. And every day it rained, shoes on, outside, running this circuit, and slowly I got closer and closer. And then one day I, I remember seeing it, it was like 2.58, and I had this massive celebration as like a young teenager in my street, pissing with rain, just going, I'm actually gonna become a professional footballer now. And that, that was the belief that I had, but also knowing you know, that's how I got ahead. Yeah, I had, um, had, had, a, had, had a goal to get, and that yeah, goal needed to be achieved. Yeah, and that was my mentality. Mm -hmm. um, when it was cold and rainy and miserable, that was the perfect time to go and train. Um, and two or three years later, my, my opportunity came up. Um, I got my scholarship to the Australian Institute of Sport and, and really took off from there. So, um, so, yeah, with the right mentality, you know, anyone from anywhere can, can achieve their, their goals. Big, big, big question on that mentality one. How is it? How is it in the kitchen? <laughs> well, does it you match up? It's um. It's, For those it's, that don't know, Jared's an unbelievable chef, <laughs> um, and obviously you spent a bit of time, obviously away from football, crafting that skill. So yeah. talk, talk to us a bit about that. Yeah, well, I think I got really lucky in life. I I grew up young and I think by the age of eight knew I wanted to either be a chef or a professional footballer. And fortunately enough, I, I've been able to do both. But um, you know, cooking was all my real, always my relaxation from football. Yeah. You know, you know, people won't realize until they get to that level that it's 365 days yeah. a year, seven days a week, 12 months of the year. You don't get holidays, you don't get weekends, you don't get social time. It's how you eat, how you sleep, all that sort of stuff, and it, it's a lot of pressure. So, um, I always found going home and just cooking and spending three and a half hours to make Vegemite toast was my, you know, my <laughs> level of, of relaxation. Um, and then naturally started getting myself into professional kitchens and, um, and they can be notoriously stressful places. Like DK, you'll know owning a couple you, yourself. Very. It's, they're stressful places. I and I think I, I went into these environments thinking that my football environment was way more stressful than that kitchen. So found it really calming. Um, so yeah, they can be they can be difficult um, difficult environments, but again, with the right mentality, you can you can find that nice calm pocket just to sit in and make food and um, and uh, yeah, pr present people some food that hopefully they'll they'll enjoy. Favorite dish to I'm make, a, favorite dish to make, and favorite dish to eat. Yeah, I'm a big uh, I love lamb. Yeah. Um, uh, I've got some some lamb cooking tonight, actually, in the uh, the slow cooker. I can so smell hopefully... it. It's unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for those who don't know, we're in my house right now. I've got, um, I've got dinner cooking over on the stove. So That's the only reason we're doing it here, mate. So I can yeah. eat some of it. <laughs> got a little five-hour slow cooked lamb on the uh, on the on the stove for the wife, so um, she'll be happy about that. Um, but uh, but yeah, since since meeting Sarah, she's she's celiac, so um, I've had to learn you know a lot of new techniques around cooking for for dietary requirements and. 
um, you know, she's obviously buzzing to be married to a, to a chef now and um, yeah, we do plenty of good cooking, but yeah, I love, I love cooking lamb. I think that's a really nice tender meat to have, but, um, but yeah, also experiment quite a bit um, working meat free as well. I think that's something that we, my, my partner and I want to do sort of ongoing is something that's a bit more sustainable and a bit more um, earth friendly. So um, there's a few little dishes that, um, that might get uh, put on a few menus around the Sunshine Coast in the next few years. We'll have to wait and see. Any more questions from you, Deeks? I've got, I've got one in regards to when you went to Gold Coast. Now, I've heard stories about Gold Coast. Team. I bet, I bet you have. <laughs> um, obviously, I've got a friend or yeah. a couple that have been in that team. Um, was that environment a, a different environment um, compared to obviously now Melbourne Victory? Because uh, oh, obviously that, that that environment, I think, from what I've been told, was very very different to a lot of A League or even professional setups. It was obviously a new team inception. Obviously, Clive Palmer, yeah. Clyberg was coaching. It was some some players put in there. Yeah. I'm, I've always had real, um, real difficulties in, in thinking about how I actually talk about my time at, at Gold Coast United because I, I owe them my career. It was the first place I went to. They gave me my opportunity um, to prove what I can do at that level. Um, they brought me in and gave me the, the opportunity to develop my, my career and it got me to the first step. Mm. You know, and even now, you know, I'm, I'm not a finished product, but it got me to a step where I could then go to the next step. And I'm always really appreciative to, you know, Mike Mulvey, to Clive Palmer, to uh, Miran Blyberg for, for all of all of that. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, some of the experiences there I should not have experienced. Um, and whether this is the right, right <laughs> podcast to actually speak about some of those, I'm not sure. But you know, there was there was times where I was I I got suspended by Clive Palmer. I was playing regularly in the A League team, and Clive Palmer said, "No, you can't play anymore." And so Miron just goes, "I can't play you." Clive's told me, "You're not allowed to play. You're not allowed to play." Um, so they sent me to play. They tried to make me play for the youth team, and I basically told them to shove it up their ass. Um, and put out the story that I was injured and all this sort of stuff. Yeah. But um, so there's a lot of politics that went on there. But yeah. at the same time, they gave us, they, you know, Clive flew us around on private jets to, oh. you know, all around the world to play preseason friendlies. He took us out on his private yachts and this and that, and um, you know, fed our families for weeks on on food, bought ice creams around the, the stadiums to yeah. this and that. But he did a lot of crazy things as well. He didn't have medical staff at training. Um, he didn't um, provide us with the basics that a professional footballer should have. Um, and I think that was really unacceptable. And the way that the club went down was a real shame. And I think that was unacceptable as well. So, like I said, I'm really conflicted in, in how I talk about it because... Experiences nonetheless, though, whether it's right yeah. or wrong. It's, it, it, it was just interesting. I've heard so many like, yeah. different... It just was like a, a crazy circus. Yeah. But at the same time, so many young footballers got so yeah. much opportunity. So yeah. there's, there's those. And, and that's the thing. <laughs> so many players like myself got an opportunity. So there's always a level of appreciation and mm. thanks because of that. Um, but I, I also can't overlook some of the absolute absurd behaviours that went on in that club. Absolutely absurd management tactics. Um, absurd player management, um, absurd signings. Like it was, it was some of the legal things that went on behind the scenes as well that obviously the PFA were, were so grateful to, to have involved with at that point. Um, and, and I'm sure there are, there are podcasts being done right now about Gold Coast United that you know, I can probably speak a bit more openly about my, my experiences. But um, number one, I had a great time there, won some great trophies there with a great lot of boys. If you're looking at the, the National Youth League team of Gold Coast United from those early days, Zach Anderson went on to have a great career. Josh Berlante is currently captain of Melbourne, Melbourne Victory. Almost every player from that squad, Chris Harold, Mitch Cooper, James Brown, um, you know, all went on to yeah. have great, um, great careers. Um, and that's only naming a few. So definitely appreciative of, of, of that, but um, yeah, certainly a few things that um, that I've taken with me to other clubs, and, and when I've seen it, you know, spoken up straight away and said that's not acceptable, and they yeah. had it fixed. 
Um, that was so, curious. Yeah. Did the hair? Did the hair come from fire to Gold Coast? <laughs> that, that and was did it stay? Um, um, <laughs> that was going to be my ending question. <laughs> if anyone hasn't seen it, go on. Just type in Jared Tyson and look at some images from about fifteen years ago because he's got a bit of a rascal haircut going on. Alvin, yeah. Well, look, Alvin, Alvin, yeah. <laughs> I, I've got to say the um, once the club had. You know, we obviously found out a lot earlier than the rest of the public that the club was going down. And at that point, we were all, all had our contracts terminated. And I was thinking, I was to see a young kid who was playing and I thought, you know, I want to try and keep my name out there so I can have the chance to go to another club. And um, yeah, I think we put it out on a, um, a social media contest to say, oh, I'm going to do something with my hair. Someone can tell me what they want to do. Because I'd had a mobile. That, that wasn't point. your own doing. No, and someone oh. put, I, I, I <laughs> turned it white. I didn't do the design. Um, but yeah, accepted it, went and did it. And um, to be fair, it worked because yeah. a, about a week later, I had a, a phone call from Zilko Kalatz, who was um, head or was goalkeeping coach at Sydney FC at that point. Um, he had a chat to me about coming to Sydney FC. And, um, uh, and just before we, you know, we'd organised it all and said, yep, no problem. And he, um, just before he hung up, he goes, but don't bring that effing haircut with you. <laughs> um, uh, well, actually, that, that's probably the nice way of putting what yeah, he said to me about say. the haircut. So look, the haircut worked. He, you know, it, it got me out there and um, got, the attention. got a bit of attention. And um, yeah, we obviously went in and, and trained with him with a fully shaved head. Um, and then ended up signing with uh, Western Sydney a, you know, a couple of weeks later. But um, but yeah, that's the, the, the story behind that. Are you going to bring it back? <laughs> <laughs> that was part B of the question, yeah. You went all the um, way around, are you bring it back or not? Um, oh, look, I'm, I'm married now, so it's a bit harder to, to be um, a bit more flamboyant. But yeah, I think this year we'll, we'll probably see... Um, you know, see how it's going. Yeah, we'll see how it's going. Um, I'm, I'm certainly not opposed to it, but... Uh, We'll maybe have to leave it to a point where, um, yeah, we, we get into some games and uh, maybe get the, the misses on side a bit more. Yeah. Thank you for joining us, boys. That's all we've got time for. And obviously, thank you to all for listening. Cheers. Cheers.